This is a freeway flyover. Those gigantic bridges that take you from one freeway to another. Places like Texas and tons of them here in California. Including this $100 million freeway ramp that's about to open. You ever wonder how they built these things? Well, I got permission to walk around on one of them under construction. And I want to show it to you. There's a lot of concrete they have to pour to build a big bridge like this one. I mean, look how fat that part is right there. But what if I told you that it's actually hollow on the inside? To explain why, let's look at all the parts that make up a giant structure like this one. Well, think about what a bridge is supposed to do. It helps you cross from one side of something to the other. So we put a couple of columns there and get a nice driving deck, put it on top. But the problem is when you get to the middle part, now you get kind of heavy and it wants to bend. You could put a thicker driving deck on there something nice and thick that's not going to bend at all but the problem is you go to put that on there and now well, you start breaking stuff you need really beefy strong columns down there to hold it up and well that could get really expensive plus you don't really need anything this thick whether it's concrete or cardboard when there's not very much material in the direction you're trying to push down it's going to bend but if you turn it sideways well now you do have a lot of material in that direction a girder put that on there Put the deck on top of that, and now it has some strength. And that's exactly what bridge engineers do. The most common way you've probably seen this are I-beams. Girders standing straight up that look like the capital letter I. The bridge deck where cars drive sits on top of those girders, which make the deck nice and rigid. So it won't bend when a big truck drives over the top of it. Okay, so I've got my bridge here with some girders mounted to the bottom. I can place that on top of the columns. And there you go. Now I have something that's lightweight, but still doesn't want to bend in the middle. Of course, this is only as good as the columns that it sits on. I need to anchor these columns to the ground. Just like a building, a bridge column needs a foundation, a way of really attaching it to the ground so it doesn't tip over. One way is to shove a bunch of metal poles into the ground, which works okay for a bridge over water, but not so much for a bridge over traffic. Another is to take a giant hydraulic hammer and pound a long metal pole deep into the earth. Well, when the state of Florida did it, it looked something like this. For this bridge, the city of Bakersfield dug a giant hole with a drill. And here comes something cool. Hoops and bars tied together with twist ties that a crane drops into the hole to give reinforcement to the concrete they're going to pour into that hole when they're done. But it's all finished, that foundation will be as deep as a 10-story building is tall. So obviously I'm not in Bakersfield, as you can tell from the snow, but I wanted to show you one of these. The rebar reinforces the concrete and kind of acts like a skeleton for the entire structure. Made up of a whole bunch of hoops that go up and up and up. You can see them up there at the top. They bend the bars. Gives them something to weld onto. And in this case, build something called a bent cap. It's kind of like a platform that the steel I-beam girders can sit on. But if you've driven around California, you might have noticed you just don't see steel I-beam girders very often here. That might be because California didn't get its first steel mill until after World War II. So engineers sort of got in the habit of relying more on concrete and less on steel. So what if instead of putting that platform on the top of the column there and then placing your girders and your driving deck on top of that, what if you just kept using concrete and poured it upside down like this? And then once it's all dry, pour a driving surface on top of that. Well, you end up kind of with this like box type shape here. One might call it a box girder bridge, like that. Now, if you could pour concrete in the air and just have it magically float there until it cures, this would be an easy job, but it's not. Construction crews and engineers have to build gigantic concrete forms that tower up in the air called faults work. These are literally as big and strong as a building. It holds everything in place until the bridge is strong enough to hold its own weight. And that's the stage the bridge is in when I get to meet two of Bakersfield city engineers. And the faults work's really impressive. Uh, Taking me on a tour of the uh, project. Uh, you know, long time to erect this faults work, you know, because like, you know, we are doing it by frame by frame. When a bridge is nearly one mile long, they can't exactly pour it all at once. So this bridge is actually several bridges. Each section called a frame. And each frame has a column that sticks up in the air that connects to a soffit, that's the smooth bottom part, that connect into several girders. 
that keep the bridge from bending. And you can see all three of those parts here. Well, two out of three anyway. These are the girders where you have some strength and then on top of all of that, they'll pour the driving surface. But if they started to pour that concrete now, it would all ooze down into those boxes between the girders. And that would make the bridge too heavy. So they cover it all up with lumber that they're willing to lose. This is called the lost deck because these pieces of plywood, uh, you're not getting them back after you pour the concrete on top. The lost deck is, um, is the only uh, uh, set of forms for the concrete that stays here forever. The rebar sticking out of the girders, so eventually you'll have to tie the, the deck rebar to the girders. With the lost deck in place, now it gets fun. A whole team of concrete experts come out to pour that driving deck. Concrete experts come out to pour that driving deck. Starting at a nearby batch plant where they mix the concrete together, a fleet of trucks zip over where a big crane pumps it up to the top of the bridge. The concrete comes out of the hose. You can see the guy pouring it right there. These guys here with that hose, they're vibrating the concrete to try to get all the air out of it because air is not very strong. And the driving deck is more than just concrete. See the web of strong reinforcing rebar steel. A number eight rebar, that's pretty fat. Yeah. <laughs> which ties to the rebar and the girders and the rest of the bridge. This helps make everything very strong. The machine back there, there's a guy up there driving it. It goes back and forth and spreads the concrete out to be nice and smooth. And then the whole thing is on rails. That whole bar will slide this way. The finished product is as smooth as glass or as much as concrete can be. But the team stopped just shy of the next frame, the next section of bridge. This gap is on purpose. So the deck where you drive on the first frame is done, the second frame is done, but the deck here at the hinge isn't done yet. Even with the help of reinforcing rebar steel, the trucks that are going to drive across this bridge are still going to push down on the bridge and try to make it sag. Well, the sagging's trying to rip it apart. So a long time ago, engineers figured out a trick. If they run a strong metal cable through a hole in the concrete and attach it on both ends and tighten it up really tight, the concrete is so squished together, it more than cancels out the sagging that big heavy truck is trying to cause. This process is called post-tensioning. But you can't tighten up that big heavy cable while the concrete is still soft. They have to wait for it to cure, which takes about a month. So that's why they leave the big gap. Because workers need to be able to get in and pull on those tension cables to compress the concrete. And you can't do that if it's buried in concrete. So the black caps that you're seeing over there, sir, after the deck has been post-tensioned. So they cannot, they cannot complete this area until until this deck is post tension, you know? Once they do finish, they pour the concrete into these L shapes called a hinge or a seat. That one is going to have an upper seat and uh, this frame is going to have a lower seat. These let each frame of the bridge move back and forth in a controlled way while still holding the bridge all together. And then you have a joint seal material between the gap so that the water is not going into the concrete. And then they can pour the crash barrier sometimes called a parapet. On both sides of the bridge are abutments, a place for each side of the bridge to sit on the ground, which is typically a big pile of specially engineered dirt if you have the room. In this case, so the, the retaining wall is this part right here. The process called mechanically stabilized earth. What does it tie to? They, they tie to this grid. Like I think it's five feet or three feet, depending on the, on the height, and they run Horizontally, you have dirt holding this retaining wall, which is stabilized. The dirt holds the wall from falling down, and in turn, the wall not falling down holds the dirt in place. Now that they've poured all the concrete and let it cure, the bridge can stand up on its own. How do you get rid of the false work if all that weight is pushing down on it? Do you ever wonder that? I, ha I have. That's what they use to remove the false work. They kind of they kind of put this underneath, and then they, they, they take it. It turns down. out to be a very slow, tedious process. They get in, they talk to California, Highway Patrol and overnight they shut the freeway down which creates a pretty gnarly traffic jam even for midnight. I know because I got caught in it. And night after night, week after week, crews carefully and surgically extract pieces of lumber bit by bit, leaving behind a beautiful bridge that drivers like me are soon probably going to go a little too fast on. They bank this thing sort of like a racetrack. It helps cars make it around the corner and it's pretty steep. Now, wish I had something round. <laughs>
a marble would really just take off. This banking is called super elevation. It also helps move rainwater to the storm drains. But where does all that water go? The huge boxes where water gets stored, and when the water, water gets to a certain level, it'll pump it into the basin. Because a project like this is a lot more than just a single bridge. It's usually part of a new highway, one that requires thousands of pages that some of the best design engineers in the country have spent long days working on. The grading, utilities, all the way to asphalt, the structures, everything is included here. The city of Bakersfield Public Works, we don't have enough engineers to take a project like this and design it. If I had to guess, I will say that at least 30 people were involved yeah. full time to do something like this. To think of every little detail a project like this needs, soil, pavement, even signs and lighting. Some of the final touches like painting the lines on the highway, or in this case, a plastic that they glue down, a thermoplastic. And we haven't even begun to touch the political aspect. Yes, we have an interstate highway in California, and it never came to Bakersfield. This project was part of a half billion dollar freeway project that took out a couple hundred houses. Something very hard to see up close, but the more you zoom out, the more it starts to make sense. Almost every city gets access to an interstate, but not Bakersfield. The region's similar in size to Albuquerque, but while even the Duke City gets two interstates, I-40 abruptly stops in the middle of the Mojave Desert. California has been gradually updating the state highway into a freeway, and this big project, which is the little tiny red dot on your map, gets them one step closer to eventually reaching Interstate 5. Now, ribbon cutting should mean that the freeway is now open to traffic, which it kinda is. At least for those of us trying to leave the parking area for the ribbon cutting. To my untrained eye, it looks ready to be used as a freeway. It actually is an opening for a couple of more weeks. The mayor tells me there's some engineering inspections that still need to happen. So the race is on. What gets done first? The freeway or me getting this video edited and pushed out to you? I'll see you next time.